What's up, y'all? It's Zach. We live in corporate. Really excited um, for this episode. Y'all probably know this week we had two big episodes. We had a, we had Ken Miller, CEO, um, in the healthcare industry, and now you know we're about to bring you another incredible episode with Roy Wood Jr. Roy Wood Jr. Y'all know who Roy Wood Jr. is, man. I mean, if you don't, I'm about to read this crazy bio. I'm gonna read the entire thing. Shout out to Roy Wood Jr.'s team. His comedy has entertained millions across the stage, television and radio, in addition to stand-up comedy, producing and acting. Roy is currently a correspondent on Comedy Central's Emmy and NAACP Award winning The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. During his tenure, he used The Daily Show's brand of satire to shed light on serious issues including gun violence, police reform, LGBTQ plus discrimination, ICE deportations, and PTSD in the black community. Wood's recent credits include guest starring in roles in Netflix comedy series Space Force, AMC's Better Call Saul, and the last OG on TBS. Roy expanded his already large role on Comedy Central with a comprehensive first look deal and is developing his comedy pilot, Jefferson County Probation. In addition, he recently created the Comedy Central web series Stand Up Playback, in which his fellow comics revisit vintage clips of them performing to see if their old jokes still hold up. Roy also wrote and starred in the Comedy Central web series The Night Pigeon, the story of a black superhero with minimal powers fighting the biggest, baddest gang in his community, the Gentrifiers. Additionally, Comedy Central is committed to produce and air Roy's third one-hour stand-up special. His second stand-up special, No One Loves You, premiered as part of Comedy Central's Stand-Up Month in January 2019. The network's highest-rating original stand-up premiere since his February 2017 one-hour father film. In 2017, he was also named the new host of Comedy Central's storytelling series, This Is Not Happening. Roy is a graduate of the FAMU University, Florida A&M, with a BS in broadcast journalism. True to his roots, he is a strong and outspoken advocate for reshaping the image of Alabama and the American South as a whole. In 2018, he penned a New York Times piece on the subject. He's actively working with the Birmingham City Council and the Film Commission to bring more entertainment jobs to the state. During his pandemic, Roy has spent time raising money for the staff of his hometown comedy club in Alabama through tipyourweightstaff.com and Laugh Aid. In 2006, he made his network television debut on The Late Show with David Letterman. In 2008, he appeared on HBO's Historic Deaf Comedy Jam. And in 2010, he was selected by America as the top three finalists on NBC's The Last Comic Standing. He has appeared on The Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson, Conan, The Tonight Show starring Jimmy Fallon, Late Night with Seth Meyers, and The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. He's also performed for the troops on numerous USO tours in the Middle East and the Pacific Islands. Prior to The Daily Show, Wood co-starred for three seasons on the TBS sitcom Sullivan and Son. Listen, I read that whole bio. Why don't you check this out, okay? We kept this show. It's explicit. We're cussing in there. I'm not cussing, so mom, please don't. Please, y'all, don't don't get me. I'm fine. I'm, I'm not cussing. But uh, we did say nigga a lot. Ooh, this might be the first time we've said nigga on Living Corporate. But listen, I just need y'all to just prepare yourselves, okay? So there's some listener discretion advised if you're sensitive to that type of language. But I think it's also really important for you to understand how black folks talk. Some of us, not everybody. Everybody don't say nigga, but I say it often. Let me just go ahead and be transparent. I say nigga a lot. Uh, I feel it is liberating and it uh, affirms me as a person. There's plenty of thought pieces about uses and variations of the N word within the black community. You should educate yourself on that. Maybe we'll talk about it another time on Living Corporate with some type of like, I don't know, professor of black studies or some linguistic person or I don't know. We'll figure it out. But just want to let y'all know I'm really excited about this episode. Stay tuned. Here it comes. Peace. Roy, man, it's an honor. Welcome to the show. I feel like this is a loaded question, but I'm going to ask anyway. How are you doing these days? Uh, I'm doing about as decent as I can, you know. Considering these quarantine times that we're living in, <laughs> uh, you know, that's yeah. that's it, man. You know, we making it. We making it. Right, right, right. Um, and we're going to get to that a little bit about like just your just the working from home dynamics a little bit later in the, in the uh, conversation. But, um, you know, I've been asking folks this fairly regularly, especially people like in my Gen X uh, cohort. You know, what I'm, saying? I'm not calling you old. I promise. I'm just uh, but I think it's important. <laughs> Nah, I wear it. It's fine. Okay, okay, cool. So, like, regarding the protests and the collective call to consciousness around anti-racism, like, you know, you were around during the Rodney King protests. Like, have you ever seen anything like this? Ooh, no. No. I mean, for Rodney King, though, just to give some perspective, that was my freshman year of high school. Wow. And there definitely wasn't any real rioting going. There was some rioting and protesting in Birmingham. Yeah. 
Yeah, I only remember that because uh, my I have an older brother that was a, at the time he was a news anchor, and so I just remember his coverage of a lot of that stuff. Wow. And I'm trying to think, man. I don't think there's a time that was that's like what we are now in terms of the ripple effect, and also feeling like for the first time as a black person feeling heard. Yeah. To a degree. Like I think that's the bigger issue. I think I think what's also been like really unique in this moment is like seeing so many white folks get beat on camera by the police. I don't know. Oh yeah, I, like, oh yeah. I'm trying to think. Yeah, <laughs> white people getting beaten record numbers, but that's a cover because they're trying to protect black people. Right. You're trying to protect niggas, you might have to take this Billy Club, and then white people is like, go ahead. <laughs> Did you see the white lady butt naked in Portland? No, I didn't see that. Um, a couple of weeks, man. Just Google butt naked white lady Portland <laughs> protest. She was out there. As a, man, as they would say in the black community, bust it wide open. Oh, no. I got yeah. to check it out. But, you know, that's, you know, that's an important part of allyship. I mean, to, I mean, like, even with that in mind, like, there are a lot of white folks out here putting their capital on the line. You know what I'm saying? That's wild to see in to see it, especially in this scope and scale. So, um, OK, so let's get right into it. Um, you know, your career started over 22 years ago. Right. How would you describe like the collective shift that black comedy has taken since you got started regarding like mainstream consumption? Like, Is there anything surprising as you kind of look across the landscape today? I think that there's more diversity in the voices of black comedians. I don't think it's fair to even say black comedy is restricted to creatives whose origin points are solely in the performative arts. Issa Rae didn't start in stand-up or, you know, improv as far as I know. Stand-up for sure she didn't. Improv, I don't know. But I would consider her part of the black comedy diaspora and what they've done over there. That show doesn't get made 20 years ago. I feel like a show like Blackish, and like I think what's the the biggest shift is that there's been a bigger trust in having creators tell the story instead of instead of a network coming in and going, hey, we just want to give you a show and plug you in there, you know? Yeah. Like, I think that you know someone like Kenya Barris who dabbled in stand up early on, but made his his name as a writer. You know, this brother is able to bring a bunch of different comedic voices and a lot of different comedic content out to the world. And so, you know, I'd say the biggest change in black comedy is that black comedians aren't the only gatekeepers of what is funny. You know, you got the young bucks, too. You know, a, a lot of if this was 10, 15 years ago, a nigga like DC Young Fly would have had to wait his turn, as they say. Right. You know wait and do enough stand up and then somebody will put you in the show and then it no that boy picked up his phone and fuck you mean his way <laughs> into <laughs> film and television right right you know y'all not gonna ignore me i'm out here i have an audience and it's he who has the audience that has the power streets don't care where the jokes come from they just want to laugh so if you're out there and you're funny and you find the people who agree you're gonna have a career and if you're nice, you're going to have a long career, you know? So yeah. I think that there's a real element of, I don't know how to put it. I, I just think that there's, there's more variety, you know, a black lady sketch show on yeah. HBO. Yeah. Um, there isn't a single comedian in that cast, not a stand up. I think, um, I would have to check and ask around about Quinta B, but I, as I recall, I don't think Quinta B comes from improv. Very funny woman. Ashley Nicole Black is an amazing writer. Um, you know, Gabrielle, like, always been an amazing actress. Yeah. Could do comedy, could do drama. Robin Thede is an amazing comedic mind. You know, yeah. she's been writing, like, her pedigree on the writing side, the comedy writing side of the game. That's, that's a 15-year... I don't want to age these, so I'll say 10 year. That's a good 10 year run. You know, I don't yeah. know, but her name is rang out with any of the bigger names in comedy. That show probably doesn't get made 20 years ago. Yeah. Or 
or they would take Robin's show and go, all right, but we got to put in Monique or some more mm. or someone that's more forward facing and prominent because then we'll believe people will watch it. Whereas now networks are like, fuck it. If it's black and it's funny, it's going to go. We don't care whether or not the faces are familiar. Get to know us. I think about like ain't a nigga ain't a, they ain't a nigga insecure that was a household name yeah. before that show with the exception of Amanda Seals. Yvonne was doing and, and I say this lovingly, you know, yeah, Yvonne yeah, yeah. Orgy, that's the homie. Yeah. And she was doing comedy and she was doing stand up, but the level of prominence that they had when they got cast as leads on that show comparative to any sitcom you can name in the black comedy diaspora from the seventies till till like Till Martin, from the seventies till Martin, you had to have already been a star somewhere else to get the shot. Where now, if you're talented and it's a good idea, we're gonna take a chance on you. And I think that's the biggest difference, you know, that I've seen. A show like Atlanta doesn't get made twenty years ago. It's too specific, and they want and they wanted black comedy to be broader. Yeah. Yeah, black comedies always had to be this broad thing. Where now it's like, no, it is a show about three niggas <laughs> in Atlanta and their daily struggles with very what, very specific the, struggles too. <laughs> but what's the theme? What? <laughs> hey, there might be an alligator in one episode. There might be a nigga in white face whispering <laughs> in another episode. An we invisible car at the, at the club. Want. Anything. But yeah, but that only happens if you have network execs that are bold enough to get out of black creatives way yeah, and let them tell the specific stories that they want to tell. And that's what's finally starting to happen, you know, all yeah. over the place. You know, so I think I, I, I know it's a long ass answer, but that's no, you, know, good. You, at, you asked. I did. So. I did. I appreciate it. No, <laughs> thank you. So, you know, it's I mean, to that point, though, about the execs is like. You know, there are a few different articles right now discussing Comedy Central's programming shift in the content that centers more black and brown voices, stories and perspectives. Like, do you think I'm overstating that your work on The Daily Show, along with Duce Sloan's and Jabuki Young White, Gina Yashir and Ronnie Chang have helped to influence that? Because I feel as if and the reason I ask is when I think about when Trevor Noah took over for The Daily Show, I mean, I would watch the daily show before, but like when he took over and then like, it was just like, I kind of looked up when I was like, man, there's a lot of black folks on the daily show. <laughs> I like a lot of you. Yeah. Trevor I, snuck them in. Yeah. You I snuck them it. in one by one. Yeah. Then you look twice. You're like, wait a minute. Where all these black people come from? Yeah. Um, I think that the network, the daily show has been a great incubator of talent as a franchise full stop. So as Trevor diversifies the show, Comedy Central ain't dumb. Let's start working with these folks to do more stuff with them. So that's been the cool part of it, you know, is if you can get your foot in the door with The Daily Show, I've had two-hour specials with the network. Respectfully, I couldn't get two-hour specials with Comedy Central before I got on The Daily Show, and Mm. I know because I tried. Mm. So there's a different world just different opportunities open up to you, you know, once somebody's able, once you get a look. And I, like half of black entertainment is just a bunch of talented niggas waiting for somebody to throw them the oop. Man. That's it. Yeah. And once you get thrown the oop, look at all these slam dunks that's coming. Right. That's just been coming down the pipe in black comedy in the last five years. So, you know, Dulce steps in, Trevor threw it a oop, boom. Now she's working on a half hour. Right. Half hour drop a half hour comedy special. Uh Jabuki's been writing on animated shows and doing his thing in LA and Trevor threw no boom. It's comedy special for him. So it's like there's there's a lot of other opportunities, but then I think as I also think part of it is maybe jealousy from network to network. Mm. You don't want to be the one to miss out. Mm. Yeah. Oh, they got some black shit. Like yeah. fucker, well, she, we need to get out of black shit. Right. Yeah. yeah some, what's, what's black? And like now, man, if I could tell you, I can't, but if I could tell you all of the shows and the diversity inquiries that have been coming down the pipeline since the George Floyd yeah. and Breonna Taylor protest started, you know, 
just with regards to people. Just, even if it's just performative diversity, fuck it. I'll take that. It's an opportunity, though. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Roy, we're looking for blacks. Do you know any blacks that could work on our show? Man, I've been recommending niggas left and right for the past <laughs> month and a half. That's I mean what I mean what else Folks, is supposed I don't to even do? Talk to no more. Like, bro, I'm just I'm out of I'm out of black people. Like, I gotta recommend black people who I know don't even fuck with me no more. But you <laughs> right for the job, and I I want you to eat because it's a victory for everybody. I want you to eat. So I'm, I ain't gonna need ain't no hate in my heart when it comes to making money. Right. Or watching somebody make money. Right. I mean, I think I think that's the that leads in well in my next question because there was this article I read today in Black Enterprise about. And it was a critique from a black lawyer um, about how black Hollywood has a responsibility to have more black representation within their teams. Right. So, you know, first of all. Oh, yeah. Jaya Thomas. Yes. Uh, the lawyer. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I read that. So. So first Shout of all, let me there. ask you, is it is it fair? Is it fair to say that you're a member of black Hollywood? And then two, what has been your approach to how you even, you know, hire folks for your team on the, the behind the scenes stuff? Uh, huh. I am I a part of Black Hollywood? Yes, full stop. Um, never. I almost said some some shady shit. I ain't gonna say nothing shady. I'm gonna be respectful. Far to Black Hollywood. Here's what I put it: If Black Hollywood was the cafeteria in high school, I wouldn't be at the cool kids table. Okay, but i'm in the cafeteria so shut the fuck up be blessed and be thankful fine okay got it got it got it um my my approach to diversity is it it has to be deliberate um i've tried as much as i can when i'm on the road as a touring comedian to take a black woman comic with me that choice is usually dictated by the number of tickets you sell in a market in markets where i'm not as popular i don't have the leverage so i'm not gonna sit here and act like i've done it every single time but about 85 percent of that time yes um we tried to do that uh the wonderful wonderful uh highly acclaimed nina shaw black attorney on the team um part of the reason why i switched agencies to where i am now um was because of diversity and there was a little bit more diversity on the team that was presented to me um at william morris and so that was very important to me yeah as i started getting into a place at comedy central where i wanted to start selling more television programs and some Mm -hmm. of this stuff is specifically black and you need someone on your team that understands that it's just Mm -hmm. an ease of execution so Having that mix um, on the team, that's beneficial. And I think more importantly for me is that I was able to benefit from being um, being with a creative partner in Comedy Central who understood this importance for diversity. You know, I'm talking two, three years ago, man, yeah, before yeah. everybody was, you know, trying to jump on the and craning around. Yeah. Bro, I shot a I shot a pilot for Comedy Central um, where I play a probation officer. It's a, it's a project that's still in development, but yeah. Comedy Central let me roll that bitch straight to Birmingham. Wow! And we shot we shot a network television show. We shot an episode of a network television show in fucking Birmingham, Alabama. That's I can't even I can't even overstate how unprecedented that is. There's film and television. There's film, there's film production in Alabama, but not a lot of TV, not scripted. Mm. So that's jobs. Yeah, that's jo- we shot in the middle of the Civil Rights District. So wow, when the conversation about staffing came up, you know, we're talking 13, 14 roles on the show. Everybody black, black woman director who went and got a black cinematographer who went and got a black DP, first AD crew, like just straight diversity through and through. And that was something that Comedy Central never pushed back on. You know, you know, it, it's just, it's one of them things where, you know, you throw somebody to oop and then you get somebody through you to oop. So you got to throw the oop to somebody else. Absolutely. And so I think that's, that's the... That's that's the biggest part of it, you know, and, you know, and I read that article from Attorney Thomas um, in Black Enterprise, and I really think that she makes a lot of fair points because a lot of the power and leverage and control in Hollywood and what gets greenlit 
comes from that executive side that is still disproportionately white. Um, right. You just have to be able, the thing, the, the unfortunate thing, this is kind of the one caveat, the unfortunate thing that most minorities are pushed into, if you're black, if you're in black Hollywood, but you're not powerful enough yet. I'm not powerful enough yet. Yeah. I'm not Will Packer. I'm not Lena Waithe. I'm not Prince Penny. I'm not Kenya Barris. Yeah. So when you're not powerful enough yet, you have to fight harder to get people in there. Yeah. To actually do the job for you. Yeah. And a lot of people won't listen to you. Mm. They straight, they'll blow you off. They'll play you to the left. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. so you all, so there, there's this contingency and I can't, and when you say black Hollywood, you're including the whole cafeteria, but really it, that shift has to start with the cool kids table mm. with a lot more people who have the power. And a lot of those people in power, they are making those changes. So that's been the cool thing to see. Yeah. But, you know, when we talk about the overall critique of it, just because you're in Black Hollywood, it doesn't mean that you have all of the power and leverage just yet. Thankfully, I had the leverage because I was with a partner. I was, you know, I, my show was at a network. I don't know if any other network would have agreed to shoot a television show in Alabama and straight give me all the inclusion that I was asking for yeah. in 2018. Yeah. They'll do it now because they don't want to get their ass roasted. Right. <laughs> but in 2018, right. I was shocked. Like, I was legit shocked. Like, time in the century, I was like, I want to shoot it in Alabama. Black people, real black, black caterers, and black locals, <laughs> and black actors. And we're going to hire, and we're going to bring jobs. And I want interns to be black and gay. <laughs> and rainbow. And they was like, cool. Wow. Okay. Well, motherfucker, <laughs> I want a black woman director. What you think about that? Yeah, fine. We'll get you a list. You can choose and go do meetings and meet and choose one. Wow. Oh, okay. Well, then let's start. Let's start production. <laughs> but I went into that bitch charged up, bro. I was ready for a fight. You ready? Yeah, you was ready to demand. And then, you know, that's, that's a pleasant surprise, though. And so look, like we're like we're both not comedians. Um, I have some, I, I have a pilot and stuff I'm writing on, but but we're both so different spaces. But we're both fathers. I'm curious how it how has it looked for you to manage your time with a toddler and managing such a high visibility profession and kind of time in your career? Like, what has that been like? Um, good creative, good father good boyfriend every day choose two okay <laughs> pretty much the deal you know every day I know I can do two of these really well one of them I'm going to suck at <laughs> and you know and, and, and that's just what it is yeah. I really underestimated how traveling for stand up comedy gave me the alone time I needed Mm. to create content so f i struggle sometimes with being alone or trying to be alone because i have people in my space that i can't ignore because they mean a lot to me right so you can't just you know your kids sitting there coloring doing backflip and shut the fuck up i'm trying to type this shit like, you can't <laughs> do that of course not yeah so i've learned how to budget I've literally learned how to partition my day into activities that can be done in his presence versus the ones that cannot. And so the stuff that I know, like if I, I if I'll catch myself at 11 o'clock at night doing something that I know I could do around him, yeah. I'll switch to a different activity like, so that I could spend time and kind of burn the candle at both ends. But, you know, it's hard. It's not, this is not ideal. This is not the way that I have ever created anything in 20 years so it's an adjustment and so you're trying to decide constantly all right well i need to write let's say the goal tonight is to write 10 pages of the script yeah i got a couple of hours can i knock out 10 pages let's see well if i'm trying to do that around them all day and it takes three hours i know if i'd have had solitude i could have done it in an hour and a half yeah you know or two hours you know um, then it's like, well, I'll just wait till tonight. 
But then now you're not sleeping regularly. Right, enough. right. So and you got to pay for that the next day. Yeah, there, there you go. So now, so now you're groggy around him and her, and you know, ain't nobody getting anything out of you. So that doesn't help anyone. So you know, it's it's interesting. It's very interesting. I mean, let me push a little bit. Like you, you kind of alluded to how it's impacted your comedy, how you do the work you do. Do you ever feel anxiety about the world you're raising your child in? Because like I'm, I'm struggling with that right now, and like I'm still trying to. So my daughter is four months old, so I'm trying to. I'm still trying to deal with like, Ooh. yeah, <laughs> yeah, man. So, so I'm still trying to manage like the anxiety of just you know. I mean, first of all, of course, I've been black my whole life, similar to you, right? So, um, yeah. <laughs> these challenges and anxieties aren't new. They wouldn't have not been here before, but I think with everything happening. You got a pandemic. A p- plenty of people that I know and love have, you know, contracted COVID. So I'm curious, like, if you if you've had those same anxieties, considering everything happened in the world as a parent. Yeah, I definitely have some level of fear of what type of world I'm preparing him for. I try to make sure that he's not completely unarmed. The biggest thing I struggle with right now. Yeah. It's how soon until I have to make my son aware of his blackness. Yeah. yeah. You know, you know, we're already working on temper tantrums and how, you know, how to behave in class because sure. I feel like, you know, black kids get unjustly disciplined. Absolutely. And, you know, stuff like that. So yeah. it, it's, it's definitely a concern, but I think the thing that I'm trying to teach him more about is not necessarily how to solve these problems, but how to manage his emotions around these issues. When you get frustrated, when you Mm. get angry, how to hold on, how to keep believing, how to continue to fight. Mm. That's going to be the most valuable weapon that I can give my child because that's what he's going to need by the bucket loads is resolve. Yeah. 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 When the police do this, do this, and then do this, and then when they say this, okay, fine. Right. But what if a cop still punches you in the mouth? Right. You or, could do everything perfect. Then what? Yeah. And then what? And then that's where in trying to manage emotions, that's when all that comes into play. I feel like there's a certain level of absurdity that we're in right now. That, like, honestly, Roy, like, <laughs> like there are things that would be funny to me if they weren't simultaneously so sad and terrifying you know um i know that you know the daily show like y'all i mean y'all do a phenomenal job of course at like pointing out the absurdity and laughing at it and i think that of course there's a certain level of performance to that i'm curious for you like how do you even keep joking in times like this like and has there ever been especially right now moments even when you're kind of like writing script or getting ready getting ready for the show that you're like you're frustrated. Like, what does that look like right now? I think on the days where we aren't in a mood to laugh, more than likely America's in the same place. And so if that's the case, then I think you tap into the outrage of what people are feeling. You know, you're not always going to land every single joke. And sometimes there isn't a time for a joke. Sometimes it's just time for a conversation and a discussion. We were off for the first two weeks of the George Floyd protest. And when we came back, those first two episodes, there were not a lot of jokes. It was just real talk and honest conversation. And I think that was the right thing um, to have at that time. I think we did a panel on that Tuesday back as well. Yeah. Where we just dialogued. Yeah. And I think that was the right choice. You know, I don't think we're ever in a place to always be funny. I think we're always in a place to add levity and, you know, analysis and reason. And sometimes that's just from a controlled conversation. And sometimes that's from jokes. Most of the time it's from jokes, you know, but. You know, I think that knowing that, you know, a lot of people turn to us, you know, for that, you know, I think, I think that people, I think that a lot of people, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that watch the daily show to laugh, but I think there's even more people that watch it just so that they can know for sure that they're not alone in feeling the way they feel about the world. And if you feel a little less alone at the end of an episode, we did our job. 
I love it, man. You know, you talked a little bit about time to jokes and time to not. I mean, I'm really curious as a as a comedian with the commentary that you have. Are there jokes that you can let fly now that you know you wouldn't have got off like three, four years ago? Oh, well, it's hard for me to say because I was doing stuff two, three <laughs> years ago that I felt, you know, like Katz was uh, was reposting my stuff about the Like I had a joke last year on my hour special, No One Loves You, about getting rid of the national anthem because it's got a whack beat and we should be singing Bruno Mars <laughs> as a country. And so when the anthem debate kind of, you know, popped up, right. that was one of the first jokes that I saw recycled. <laughs> you know <laughs> online you know i've yeah. always been trying to you know fire away at the hip you know i do think that the trick now i think i think a better way to answer your question is i can be a little more angry in my material now and it's okay because yeah. you know that we're angry whereas before i had to smile a little bit more mm. when i talked about shit that i was angry about I always felt this impulse where well, I don't want to make them uncomfortable. So let me give them a little, show them a little teeth. I'm going to still talk about police reform and it's going to be, I'm going to talk about some heavy shit. Right. But I'm going to try to smile every now and then. But, and now I just don't, if I don't want to, I don't have to and it's okay. And yep. I, and I really believe that that's probably the biggest difference between, you know, pre and post COVID comedy is that you have the freedom and autonomy to be upset. Kind of like, it's, it's similar, and I don't know if enough people track this, but I did because I'm a comedy nerd, but mm. it's similar to what happened around the rise of the Me Too movement with a lot more women comics being more, much more outspoken on stage in their material and feeling confident and going, nah, this is what the hell I'm going to talk about. And this is what y'all can listen to. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the freedom to be angry is something that, you know, I think is a beautiful thing. It is. And I'm going to tell you, for like I, that freedom that you're talking, it translates into uh corporate world, too. Right. So, like, I'm, a, I'm in consulting. And so there's much more space I feel like I have. I'm not, quote unquote, allowed to have without, you know, immediate retribution. We'll see what happens with this white lash, man. I, I'm still not trusting. I don't know what's going to happen in the next six months. But for right now. You know, we're able to speak, you know, speak our minds a little bit. Um, so, you know, I mean, it is a beautiful thing. Look, Roy, this has been great, man. You 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 went over time with me. I appreciate you. Um, before, it's my love. Man, I, I feel it. Um, before we let you go, man, any parting words or shout outs? No, man, I appreciate you for doing what you're doing and just keep bringing some good shit to the folks, man. All right. Uh, when I got my little podcast and all my stuff off the ground, man, I love to call back in and check in with you. Oh, man. I mean, I'm going to hold you to that. (laughs) All right, man. All right, now. Talk to you later. All right, have a good one. You too. Peace. Yes, sir. Yep. All right, y'all. That's been Living Corporate. Man, it's a really laid back, real conversation. Um, First comedian we've had on the on the pod. And I look forward to catching y'all next time. Until next time, this has been Zach. You've been listening to Roy Wood Jr., comedian, speaker, uh, leader. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.